large networks that have had been around at the time, as in they were not completely new. Um, so they were reasonably mature, but 50 years have elapsed. And when we look back, we can kind of see I mean, how much has really changed in those years. Uh, and so I took my the trans, kind of a layer four network, I mean, the real transport network, I, of 1970, so roughly uh, 50 years ago, uh, in that, and it looked surprisingly, uh, even to me, surprisingly familiar. So my, we recognize uh, my A Porsche 911, uh, we recognize the 747, we recognize the Metroliner, we probably don't quite recognize that this is one of the early uh, Toyota Corollas, uh, that's my, kind of one of the most popular cars in that, as a mainstream car. And indeed, if you look at pure performance measures, I won't be, I, the push was certainly fast enough uh, to get uh, a hefty uh, speeding fine even back then. The 747 was probably as comfortable uh, or more comfortable than most planes are today. Uh, Amtrak hasn't gotten much faster and my 37 miles per gallon is, uh, my many hybrids don't quite make that because they're much Weighty. And indeed, um, even in 1970, we had uh, a package transportation mechanism, namely a uh, kind of a version of ATM, if you want to call it that, namely early container ships that have now become a um, dominant uh, mode of uh, international supply chains that we all hear about uh, is existed even in their early forms. Uh, in, so in a sense, in a network that shared many characteristics, large scale distributed actors, uh, at the time reasonably mature technology, just like the internet was as communication technology initially, not as a um, individual technology, are recognizably the same 50 years later. Now it doesn't mean that communication networks will follow the same pattern, obviously not, but it provides an argument that we might actually, if we uh, uh, transport ourselves 50 years in the future, that we might not feel completely um, unfamiliar territory. So let's look at 25 years ago, uh, simply because that's probably somewhat more familiar. Again, we could already see the beginnings of today's communication technology. Uh, IBM, just to take on them, uh, introduced kind of what you might call the first smartphone, uh, or one of the first smartphones as an in integrated communication technology uh, and uh, computing uh, in that. Needless to say, they probably wish that they were uh, as well recognized for that particular field uh, as uh, Apple and Google and Samsung are today. Um, and we had kind of the first modern uh, enterprise wireless networks. We had a reasonably recognizable web browser uh, in that, and so on. So all of these things, we had video uh, type of transmission, uh, webcams, all of the type of things uh, that were roughly 25 years ago. Um, are, well, they look different, but they're certainly functionally cousins of what we have. So, but if we look at the transportation network in particular, and this is where I think I, I'm connecting to the previous talk, is that one of the ways, even though the systems that existed in the 1970s looked familiar, as in they were not fundamentally different, they didn't use a different engine technology, man. Uh, they used a combustion engine, they used diesel engines, uh, they used jet engines, just like they do today, is what has changed and has steadily changed for these, uh, at the time mature ones, is even if you start in the 1970s, there was a steady introduction of safety and security technologies that have continued to drive down the accident rates per vehicle mile traveled. Uh, you know. So I put some dates in there that were roughly in the 50 year time horizon or slightly shorter in some cases, namely kind of what I would see as the primary automotive 
uh, passenger focused uh, safety technologies, seat belts, airbags, and ABS um, as both passive and active type of technologies in that. And those have really helped to drive down the risk of using most technologies. And if you look even at aviation safety, again, just starts conveniently in 1970, is we have continued the industry, not us, as kind of a researcher in a different area, have made continuous progress through a variety of mechanisms to reduce the overall accident rate. Pricing, similarly, uh, their networks have looked much better. In fact, this has been one of the um, success rates that's really starting uh, with a pretty continuous drop, transit prices in particular, lesser for access prices, but even there in per megapaces, have seen a year over year decrease in the 20 to 20 uh, to 30 percent range, even though again, uh, these are relatively mature technologies at the time. So that offers some hope that we will continue to see that. We've also seen that I, the notion that we can improve safety and reliability by using automation is has eerie similarities to uh, what we see in the transportation system. I don't know what happened precisely in the Facebook case when they dropped off the planet for five hours plus, uh, but from a distance from all they have published, it looks essentially similar to kind of, they had automation, a lot of things happened very rapidly and all by themselves, by themselves systems reacted. They just reacted in a way that was inappropriate to the circumstances, just like a Tesla not recognizing that a police car was parked on the side of a highway and rammed it uh, uh, like a few weeks ago. Uh, in that. So we are in this period where I, my one advance in many safety systems in other areas, um, whether that's energy safety or whether that's transportation safety or automation, we are in this odd period where one could argue that many of the automation that we are doing in networking actually means that we can shoot ourselves into in, in our foot much more rapidly. So we have created an, a, a, an automatic weapon uh, that may amplifies mistakes as much as it prevents mistakes. So hopefully over the next 50 years, we can do better than that. But some of the skepticism that has emerged for autonomous vehicles as arriving soon may also affect the ability to do network simply because of the same kind of one-off conditions that were not anticipated in the case of Facebook. Unfortunately, our safety record as a, as a industry, if you want to call it broadly speaking, shows exactly the wrong trajectory, as in the risks as oppressed by, say, just malware keeps going up uh, over time simply because the attack surface, as Lisa was talking about, has gone up so much. I'd also argue, and Jim, this should look familiar, uh, this is out of uh, one of the first editions. Of, again, this is only about 20 years ago. Um, it wasn't a textbook that I could easily find that was 50 years old, is that if you look at kind of a textbook that we taught, uh, many of us learned from or taught in early in our career, um, it doesn't actually look all that different than what we're teaching today. Again, this is a 20 year time horizon, but I wouldn't be surprised if many of the chapters uh, that we were teaching, well, uh, certainly my successor will teach 50 years from now, won't look all that different. And indeed, if we look at standardization, this is again, um, 50 years ago didn't really exist. So I took approximation about 30 years ago. Uh, we still have many of the same discussions. We have the same areas pretty much still in the IATF. Uh, we still have many of the same protocols that are being worked on. Clearly a few things have changed. Uh, we don't have a Telnet group anymore uh, in that, uh, but my, the ABT group still exists and a few other groups still uh, are chugging along. And so even standardization has a longevity that is uh, surprisingly long. 
So why has, relatively speaking, so little changed in that? So I would argue that if you look at kind of what I perceive to be major changes in the last decade, again, narrowing the time horizon a bit, uh, that, is, uh, that the browser has actually seen a significant amount of change. This is my just it used to be that all you had to do is teach your students a bit of HTML and my, they could be web developers. That is truly no longer sufficient. We now have all kinds of technologies, some great, some not so great, uh, that encompass essentially a miniature operating system and a miniature windowing system and a miniature security system all into a browser. Uh, in the data center, we have seen significant, but I'd argue somewhat less impactful changes uh, in that through software-defined networking, heterogeneous computing, wax scale type of hardware integration in that access network, maybe not so much. In a sense that the top speeds have changed, but for, I think, generally speaking, from a consumer perspective, 5G has pretty much been a kind of a, a disappointment uh, that really hasn't changed much what uh, the consumer experience has been, particularly if you compare that with the transitions from 2G to 3G or 3G to 4G, uh, just the difference is not generational, it is incremental. Um, same for DOCSIS uh, in, in that sense. And in the internet, largely, I would say the largest change uh, has been with the transport level. Um, particularly like, I, I think uh, others will have something to say on that. I, what has changed, and this is actually probably a snapshot that I would need to update in a few years, is that the number of players differs dramatically in the sense that we have a relatively small number of players um, at the other areas we are essentially Chrome and Firefox and maybe Safari uh, and Edge decide to do that, or maybe even less so, one or two engines that, I mean, web rendering engines that underlie all of these ones that they're no longer doing their own thing, then uh, you can push changes to a large number. Uh, in the internet, we currently still have hundreds to thousands of actors that all need to be cajoled to do stuff. Uh, that will clearly, or is on the way to changing, as I think a number of other people will uh, describe in that. And backward compatibility has really been one where on the internet scale that we really have a minimum feature set win simply because that's what you can expect to find. Uh, in, and we have other techniques in other areas. And the incentives differ dramatically. So extrapolating from one area such as browsers to the internet is just not very uh, helpful simply because the incentive systems that exist in those are just very different. They just don't apply. So the model of change or what the research questions are is just very different when you're looking at spectral efficiency versus say OPEX dominated. And indeed, uh, if we go back to existing network, uh, many of the existing systems have a surprisingly long lifetime in that, in that. So, which makes me think that if we look ahead to 2070, is that we'll probably still have phone numbers, we'll probably still have IPv6 addresses. I hope that we no longer have SS7, uh, but who knows, we may still have a fax machine and a doctor's office somewhere. And we, I mean, I believe that what has happened, and you can see this in the news coverage uh, on, there used to be a fair amount of coverage when kind of mainstream media started f first covering the internet on internet applications, uh, kind of new applications on uh, maybe even new protocols on occasion, or uh, they wouldn't call it that, but kind of developments in speed and so on, kind of lower layer things and that. But we basically, almost all the coverage that is networking related these days tends to be uh, either political or financial uh, in, uh, in the sense that we're moving as previous talk indicated us in cybersecurity, network neutrality, what are the obligations of network carriers, what are the obligations of purveyors of news, uh, even though we think of them as maybe network applications that are really more new, become news media in that kind of in the social networks uh, we deal with, and that things are moving into the application 
And then we also have probably a fair amount of research going on in the 5G and 6G style AI quantum communications, primarily at the lowest layer, simply because there's an incentive for small performance improvements matter uh, there. Less so, and I think this will continue in the middle layers. Uh, even if you take quick as kind of a high point about um, the changes in performance of visible services is relatively speaking modest. And indeed, I suspect we'll see a continuing conflict between uh, carriers, uh, what they are and who they want to be. Uh, in the sense that we've had, as long as my digital communication has existed, carriers wanting to add services and advertising and media and maybe theme parks even to their portfolio is what they avoid, want to avoid commoditization, even though that's what the users want. They want really, even though they may not know about, what they really want is carriers to compete on price for a high quality product that is uniform, meaning making switching easy between commodity providers, as opposed to having be attempting to become cloud providers uh, or content providers like AT&T try to do or become voice providers uh, and some modestly successful as being in that. So again, this is not surprising, uh, but my suspicion is that we'll see whatever quantum software provider attempts by whatever Verizon is called in 2070 if it still exists at that point. So networks in general exist for about 20 years. If you look at the generation, we're just now getting rid of 3G basically uh, in that, that was started about 20 years ago in that. So that means we are about two, two and a half generations away from the 2070 network. So that 6G will have faded uh, if we still use generational network nomenclature, I hope we won't uh, in that, but not that unfamiliar. I'd also argue that generally speaking, we have been really bad about predicting what, even in the wireless sense, what these networks are uh, doing. If you compare the keynotes to reality or the industry uh, hype to reality, it turned out to be relatively uh, quite different in almost every generation that I've been able to look at uh, in that. What has been constant is really, and this is clearly an approximation, uh, for round numbers purposes, but it, not too far off my perceived reality, is that where they have been successful is dropping each generation the cost per gigabyte at the consumer level, not the wholesale, at the consumer level has dropped by about a factor of 10. Uh, in that. It still means that's usually about a factor of 10 to 100 more expensive than wired networks, but it is dropping by that, and so I believe that if we were to extrapolate, that has to continue uh, as kind of a very simple driver, leaving aside all the other notions that 6G, kind of a topic of a day, is going to support quantum teleportation, or whatever, and I enable AI enabled VR, whatever it is. So, if I were to Wager a prediction for 2070 is that the internet as communication infrastructure is going to be the domain of relatively few people uh, that are considered relatively boring, that only get noticed when things don't work, just like road builders generally only get noticed, or bridge builders generally only get uh, noticed when there's a traffic jam, or uh, heaven forbid, when a bridge collapses, we will be in that, uh, my power successors. Uh, it largely will be in that category. I don't want to, a wild card uh, is that in 50 years time, we will have, it is quite possible that our political landscape will look quite different than what we know. Projecting out, particularly the future of the uh, kind of the larger democracies in the world seems very much less certain than it might have been 50 years ago when you could reasonably assume that the US would still be a democracy. Um, I think our betting odds for that are much lower than maybe some of us feel comfortable with. If that were the case, if we basically have uh, three illiberal democracies or autocracies as the dominant 
uh, players economically and technically in the world with maybe a few with Switzerland and Sweden left as democracies, the internet will look very different technically, not because of what we do as researchers, but because what our successors as researchers will be forced to do, namely to provide surveillance and other capabilities to whoever is in charge, not because we love security. Indeed, security will be largely dominated by the need to do monitoring uh, by those actors. And this includes, unfortunately, uh, the illiberal version of the United States, which seems increasingly likely. Um, and or we will have conversely a corporate network where you don't really connect to a neutral network in between, you directly connect to one or few providers, kind of a cable version of the internet. So we're not done yet. I, so I see a limited increase in user visible speed um, in that. I, will we get to final to self-managing networks? Well, we'll see uh, in that. It's, it's, Likely, just like autonomous vehicle are going to turn out to be a lot harder than uh, you would, than I think we are anticipating because of the, uh, we don't need to deal with 80%. We need to deal with the exception cases uh, well and do that reliably and not crash the whole network. Uh, in that, will we have new upper layer services? Uh, will blockchain be the new peer to peer hype or will it actually lead to something? And uh, data privacy, obviously, uh, particularly will be dominated by political considerations, not by uh, the uh, technical capabilities uh, in and of itself. And with that, I'll take questions or comments. Thank you, Henning. Uh, so all attendees, if you have questions, please put it in the question and answer session uh, panel, which you can access on the lower right hand side of the WebEx screen. Um, when you can send it either to the host or to the speaker or all panelists. Wendy, any questions in that panel? Okay, I see I see a few questions uh, coming up. There's a question called, do you think IP will stay the same? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so my hope is that we'll have at least IPv6 um, and some version in it, but I do believe that the incentives currently are such that uh, alternatives, which primarily means from what I can tell, some of the new IP work as well as ICN type of efforts. I, uh, I have yet to hear a convincing um, economic argument. I died, they significantly, not by a few percent, I decrease the cost of operation. They clearly aren't dramatically more um, when, uh, more efficient in some way, like some a new modulation method might be, or some new radio technology would be. So they are not like, I uh, have an immediate advantage, unlike say previous lower layer technology advances, it seems pretty clear that say, uh, new IP, it doesn't have short, but isn't gonna make networks faster. Uh, ICNs are unlikely to be faster than uh, deploying uh, CDNs like we already do. Uh, particularly as content becomes more um, kind of interactively generated. So it seems like the economic um, argument would say that there's very little incentive, and we've already seen this in the transition from IPv4 to IPv6, where there, well, there is an economic incentive, namely addresses are just much more expensive in the old version um, in that, in the sense you have to get them on the secondary market um, at, at small quantities. And so in that sense, Unless there's an economic incentive, we can love whatever new network technology. I just don't see it as having a transition path uh, into widespread usage uh, until that changes. So there's one question I see um, in this. I don't know if I still have, if you want to move on, let's, I'm 
Um, so, uh, Henning, why don't you answer this one next question and then let's switch to um, Jennifer. Yep. So let me talk about the Google version. Um, and, uh, and I think we'll hear, if I kind of peek at the upcoming presentations, I think we'll hear a much more um, well-founded discussion on and some of those is, it is a model that seems to be happening is that we get an increasing, that a version is evolving that looks surprisingly similar to the early days of the internet from a consumer perspective, namely where you subscribe to AOL uh, or subscribe to CompuServe or you subscribed to a kind of brief when French or German versions, Teletext and uh, Minitel and so on. And you had gateways to the rest of the internet and to the rest of the content right, in that, in the case of AOL and Comptures of the internet, early days of the internet by email and others. And so that, that may not be as visible, so the seams may not be as visible, but there are clear advantages from a consumer perspective, namely uh, you get modern technology, you get probably a lot of security protection because Google will take care of you um, or whoever succeeds Google. Uh, and so from a consumer perspective, this will be attractive, but it will fundamentally change the internet. And again, this could also mean this happens at the national level where you then have a national version, the Russian version of the internet, the Chinese version of the internet, and maybe the uh, Hungarian uh, US version of the internet, uh, which for political reason becomes essentially a single corporate entity uh, or a small number of corporate entity as has happened in China that are licensed essentially indirectly or directly to provide content and connectivity and nobody else can enter that market primarily for control reasons, not for technical reasons. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Henning. Thanks for your comment.